I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors had been for many years councillors and syndics, and my father had filled several public situations with honor and reputation. He was respected by all who knew him for his integrity and indefatigable attention to public business. He passed his younger days perpetually occupied by the affairs of his country. A variety of circumstances had prevented his marrying early, nor was it until the decline of his life that he became a husband and the father of a family. When I had attained the age of 17, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, but my father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date. I very sadly told my plans to Elizabeth, my childhood sweetheart, and now my fiancé, and to Clerval, my firm friend. I threw myself into the chaise that was to convey me away and indulged in the most melancholy reflections. I, who had ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in endeavouring to bestow mutual pleasure, I was now alone. In the university whither I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingolstadt, which was long and fatiguing. At length, the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment to spend the evening as I pleased. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, I went into the lecturing room, of which a Monsieur Waldman entered shortly after. He appeared about fifty years of age, but with an aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few grey hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. His person was short but remarkably erect, and his voice the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a recapitulation of the history of chemistry and the various improvements made by different men of learning, pronouncing with fervor the names of the most distinguished discoverers. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science and explained many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. Such were the professor's words. Rather, let me say, such were the words that fate announced to destroy me. As he went on, I felt as if my soul was grappling with a palpable enemy. One by one, the various keys were touched which formed the mechanism of my being. Chord after chord was sounded, and soon my mind filled with one thought, one conception, one purpose. So much has been done... More, far more, will I achieve. Treading the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation. One of the phenomena which had peculiarly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and indeed any animal endued with life. Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one which has ever been considered as a mystery. 
Yet, with how many things are we upon the brink of becoming acquainted if cowardice or carelessness did not restrain our inquiries? I revolved these circumstances in my mind and determined thenceforth to apply myself more particularly to those branches of natural philosophy which relate to physiology. Unless I had been animated by an almost supernatural enthusiasm, my application to this study would have been irksome and almost intolerable. To examine the causes of life, we must first have recourse to death. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, and this was not sufficient. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. My attention was fixed upon every object the most insupportable to the delicacy of the human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. I paused, examining and analyzing all the minutiae of causation as exemplified in the change from life to death and death to life, until from the midst of this darkness a sudden light broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illustrated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries towards the same science, that I alone should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. Remember, I am not recording the vision of a madman. The sun does not more certainly shine in the heavens than that which I now affirm is true. Some miracle might have produced it, yet the stages of the discovery were distinct and probable. After days and nights of incredible labor and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay, more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. When I found so astonishing a power placed within my hands, I hesitated a long time concerning the manner in which I should employ it. Although I possessed the capacity of bestowing animation, yet to prepare a frame for the reception of it, with all its intricacies of fibers, muscles, and veins, still remained a work of inconceivable difficulty and labor. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself, or one of simpler organization. But... My imagination was too much exalted by my first success to permit me to doubt of my ability to give life to an animal as complex and as wonderful as man. The materials at present within my command hardly appeared adequate for so arduous an undertaking, but I doubted not that I should ultimately succeed. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all the other apartments by a gallery and staircase, I kept my workshop of filthy creation. My eyeballs were starting from their sockets and attending to the details of my employment. The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials, and often did my human nature turn with loathing from my occupation, whilst, still urged on by an eagerness which perpetually increased, I brought my work near to a conclusion. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost mounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life round me, that I might infuse the spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull, yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Or how delineate the wretch whom, with such infinite pains and care, I had endeavored to form. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. <laughs> beautiful! Great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing. 
his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardour that far exceeded moderation, but now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bedchamber, unable to compose my mind to sleep. At length, lassitude succeeded to the tumult I had before endured, and I threw myself on the bed in my clothes, endeavouring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. But it was in vain. I started from my sleep with horror. A cold dew covered my forehead, my teeth chattered, and every limb became convulsed, when by the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the window shutters, I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened and he muttered some inarticulate sounds while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out, seemingly to detain me, but I escaped and rushed downstairs. I took refuge in the courtyard belonging to the house which I inhabited, where I remained the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching and fearing each sound as if it were to announce the approach of the demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life. I did not dare to return to the apartment which I inhabited, but felt impelled to hurry on, although drenched by the rain which poured from the black and comfortless sky. Continuing thus, I came at length opposite to an inn at which the various diligences and carriages usually stopped, here I paused. I knew not why. But I remained for some minutes with my eyes fixed on a coach that was coming towards me from the other end of the street. As it drew nearer, I observed that it was the Swiss diligence. It stopped just where I was standing, and on the door being opened, I perceived Henry Clerval, who, on seeing me, instantly sprang out. "'My dear Frankenstein,' exclaimed he, "'how glad I am to see you!' How fortunate that you should be here at the very moment of my alighting. Nothing could equal my delight on seeing Clerval. His presence brought back to my thoughts my father, Elizabeth, and all those scenes of home so dear to my recollection. I grasped his hand and said, It gives me the greatest delight to see you. But tell me how you left my father, brothers, and Elizabeth. Very well and very happy, only a little uneasy that they hear from you so seldom. By the by, I mean to lecture you a little upon their account myself. But, my dear Frankenstein, continued he, stopping short and gazing full in my face, I did not before remark how very ill you appear, so thin and pale. You look as if you had been watching for several nights. <laughs> You've guessed rightly. I have lately been so deeply engaged in one occupation <laughs> that I have not allowed myself sufficient rest, as you see. But <laughs> I hope, I sincerely hope, that <laughs> all these employments are now at an end and that I am at length free. <laughs> My dear Victor, he cried, what, for God's sake, is the matter? How ill you are! What is the cause of all this? Do not ask me, cried I, <laughs> putting my hands before my eyes, for I thought I saw the dreaded spectre glide into the room. He can tell you. Oh, save me! Save me! I imagined that the monster seized me. I struggled furiously and fell down in a fit. Summer passed away in the occupations, and my health and spirits had long been restored, and they gained additional strength from the salubrious air I breathed and the conversation of my friend. 
On the morrow, I found the following letter from my father. My dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return to us, and I was at first tempted to write only a few lines, merely mentioning the day on which I should expect you. But that would be a cruel kindness, and I dare not do it. William is dead. That sweet child whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle yet so gay, Victor, is murdered. I will not attempt to console you, but will simply relate the circumstances of the transaction. Last Thursday, I, my niece, and your two brothers went to walk in Plain Palais. The evening was warm and serene, and we prolonged our walk further than usual. It was already dusk before we thought of returning, and then we discovered that William and Ernest, who had gone on before, were not to be found. We accordingly rested on a seat until they should return. Presently, Ernest came and inquired if we had seen his brother. He said that he had been playing with him, that William had run away to hide himself, and that he vainly sought for him, and afterwards waited for him a long time, but that he did not return. This account rather alarmed us, and we continued to search for him until night fell, when Elizabeth conjectured that he might have returned to the house. He was not there. We returned again with torches, for I could not rest when I thought that my sweet boy had lost himself and was exposed to all the damps and dews of night. Elizabeth also suffered extreme anguish. About five in the morning, I discovered my lovely boy. From the night before, I had seen blooming and active in health, stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. The print of the murderous finger was on his neck. Come, dearest Victor, you alone can console Elizabeth. She weeps continually and accuses herself unjustly as the cause of his death. Her words pierce my heart. We are all unhappy, but will not that be an additional motive for you, my son, to return and be our comforter? Your dear mother. Alas, Victor. I now say, thank God she did not live to witness the cruel, miserable death of her youngest darling. Come, Victor, not with brooding thoughts of vengeance against the assassin, but with feelings of peace and gentleness that will heal instead of festering the wounds of our minds. Enter the house of mourning, my friend, but with kindness and affection for those who love you, and not with hatred for your enemies. Your affectionate and afflicted father, Alphonse Frankenstein. My journey was very melancholy. At first I wished to hurry on, for I longed to console and sympathize with my loved and sorrowing friends. But when I drew near my native town, I slackened my progress. I could hardly sustain the multitude of feelings that crowded into my mind. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to pass the night at Secheron, a village at the distance of half a league from the city. The sky was serene, and as I was unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where poor William had been murdered. As I could not pass through the town, I was obliged to cross the lake in a boat to arrive at Plain Palais. During this short voyage, I saw the lightnings playing on the summit of Mont Blanc in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared to approach rapidly, and on landing, I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. While I watched the tempest, so beautiful yet terrific, I wandered on with a hasty step. This noble war in the sky elevated my spirits. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me. Its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspect, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. What did he there? 
could he be? I shuddered at the conception. The murderer of my brother? No sooner did that idea cross my imagination than I became convinced of its truth. My teeth chattered, and I was forced to lean against a tree for support. The figure passed me quickly, and I lost it in the gloom. Nothing in human shape could have destroyed that fair child. He was the murderer. I could not doubt it. The mere presence of the idea was an irresistible proof of the fact. I thought of pursuing the devil, but it would have been in vain, for another flash discovered him to me, hanging among the rocks of the nearly perpendicular ascent of Mont Salève, a hill that bounds Plain Palais on the south. He soon reached the summit and disappeared. No one can conceive the anguish I suffered during the remainder of the night, which I spent cold and wet in the open air. But I did not feel the inconvenience of the weather. My imagination was busy in scenes of evil and despair. I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he had now done, nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit, let loose from the grave and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Day dawned, and I directed my steps towards the top of the ascent. For some time I sat upon the rock that overlooks the sea of ice, a mist covered both that and the surrounding mountains. Presently, a breeze dissipated the cloud, and I descended upon the glacier. The sea, or rather the vast river of ice, wound among its dependent mountains, whose aerial summits hung over its recesses. Their icy and glittering peaks shone in the sunlight over the clouds. My heart, which was before sorrowful, now swelled with something like joy. I exclaimed, Wandering spirits, if indeed ye wander and do not rest in your narrow beds, allow me this faint happiness, or take me as your companion away from the joys of life. As I said this, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man at some distance advancing towards me with... Superhuman speed, he bounded over the crevices in the ice, among which I had walked with caution. His stature, also, as he approached, seemed to exceed that of a man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes, and I felt a faintness seize me, but I was quickly restored by the cold gale of the mountains. I perceived, as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and abhorred, that it was the wretch whom I had created. I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to wait his approach and then close with him in mortal combat. He approached. His countenance bespoke bitter anguish combined with disdain and malignity, while its unearthly ugliness rendered it almost too horrible for human eyes. But I scarcely observed this. Rage and hatred had at first deprived me of utterance, and I recovered only to overwhelm him with words expressive of furious detestation and contempt. Devil, I exclaimed, do you dare approach me? And do not you fear the fierce vengeance of my arm wreaked on your miserable head? Be gone, vile insect, or rather stay, that I may trample you to dust. And oh, that I could, with the extinction of your miserable existence, restore those victims whom you have so diabolically murdered. I expected this reception, said the demon. All men hate the wretched. How, then, must I be hated, who am miserable beyond all living things? Yet you, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature, to whom thou art bound by ties only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us. You purpose to kill me. How dare you sport thus with life? Do your duty towards me, and I will do mine towards you and the rest of mankind. If you will comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the maw of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. Abhorred monster, fiend that thou art, the tortures of hell are too mild a vengeance for thy crimes. Wretched devil! 
You reproach me with your creation? Come on, then, that I may extinguish the spark which I so negligently bestowed. My rage was without bounds. I sprang on him, impelled by all the feelings which can arm one being against the existence of another. He easily eluded me and said, Be calm. I entreat you to hear me before you give vent to your hatred on my devoted head. Have I not suffered enough that you seek to increase my misery? Life, although it may only be an accumulation of anguish, is dear to me, and I will defend it. Remember, thou hast made me more powerful than thyself. My height is superior to thine, my joints more supple. But I will not be tempted to set myself in opposition to thee. I am thy creature, and I will be even mild and docile to my natural lord and king if thou wilt also perform thy part, the which thou owest me. O oh, Frankenstein, be not equitable to every other, and trample upon me alone, to whom thy justice and even thy clemency and affection are most due. Remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss from which I alone am irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy, and I shall again be virtuous. As he said this, he led the way across the ice. I followed. My heart was full, and I did not answer him, but as I proceeded, I weighed the various arguments that he had used, and determined at last to listen to his tale. I was partly urged by curiosity, and compassion confirmed my resolution. I had hitherto supposed him to be the murderer of my brother, and I eagerly sought a confirmation or denial of this opinion. For the first time, also, I felt what the duties of a creator towards his creature were, and that I ought to render him before I complained of his wickedness. These motives urged me to comply with his demand. We crossed the ice, therefore, and ascended the opposite rock. The air was cool... The rain again began to descend. We entered a hut, the fiend with an air of exultation, I with a heavy heart and depressed spirits. But I consented to listen, and seating myself beside the fire, which my odious companion had lighted, he thus began his tale. It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being. All the events of that period appear confused and indistinct. A strange multiplicity of sensations seized me, and I saw, felt, heard, and smelt at the same time. And it was, indeed, a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. By degrees, I remember, a stronger light pressed upon my nerves, so that I was obliged to shut my eyes. Darkness then came over me and troubled me, but hardly had I felt this when, by opening my eyes, as I now suppose, the light poured in upon me again. I walked, and I believe descended, but I presently found a great alteration in my sensations. Before, dark and opaque bodies had surrounded me, impervious to my touch or sight, but I now found that I could wander on at liberty with no obstacles which I could not either surmount or avoid. The light became more and more oppressive to me, and the heat wearying me as I walked, I sought a place where I could receive shade. This was the forest near Ingolstadt, and here I lay by the side of a brook resting from my fatigue until I felt tormented by hunger and thirst. This roused me from my nearly dormant state, and I ate some berries which I found hanging on the trees or lying on the ground. I slaked my thirst at the brook, and then, lying down, was overcome by sleep. It was dark when I awoke. I felt cold also and half frightened, as it were instinctively, finding myself so desolate. Soon 
A gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. I started up and beheld a radiant form arise from among the trees. I gazed with a kind of wonder. It moved slowly, but it enlightened my path, and I again went out in search of berries. I continued to wind among the paths of the wood until I came to its boundary, which was skirted by a deep and rapid river, into which many of the trees bent their branches, now budding with the fresh spring. Here I paused, not exactly knowing what path to pursue, when I heard the sound of voices that induced me to conceal myself under the shade of a cypress. I was scarcely hid when a young girl came running towards the spot where I was concealed, laughing as if she ran from someone in sport. She continued her course along the precipitous sides of the river when suddenly her foot slipped and she fell into the rapid stream. I rushed from my hiding place and with extreme labor from the force of the current saved her and dragged her to shore. She was senseless, and I endeavored by every means in my power to restore animation when I was suddenly interrupted by the approach of a rustic, who was probably the person from whom she had playfully fled. On seeing me, he darted towards me and, tearing the girl from my arms, hastened towards the deeper parts of the wood. I followed speedily, I hardly knew why, but when the man saw me draw near, he aimed a gun which he carried at my body and fired. I sank to the ground, and my injurer, with increased swiftness, escaped into the wood. This was then the reward of my benevolence. I had saved a human being from destruction, and as a recompense I now writhed under the miserable pain of a wound which shattered the flesh and bone. The feelings of kindness and gentleness which I had entertained but a few minutes before gave place to hellish rage and gnashing of teeth. Inflamed by pain, I vowed eternal hatred and vengeance to all mankind. Cursed! Cursed creator, why did I live? Why in that instant did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you had so wantonly bestowed? I know not. Despair had not yet taken possession of me. My feelings were those of rage and revenge. But the agony of my wound overcame me. My pulses paused, and I fainted. For some weeks I led a miserable life in the woods, endeavoring to cure the wound which I had received. The ball had entered my shoulder, and I knew not whether it had remained there or passed through. At any rate, I had no means of extracting it. My sufferings were augmented also by the oppressive sense of the injustice and ingratitude of their infliction. My daily vows arose for revenge, a deep and deadly revenge such as would alone compensate for the outrages and anguish I had endured. But my toils now drew near to a close, and in two months from this time I reached the environs of Geneva. It was evening when I arrived, and I retired to a hiding place among the fields that surrounded it to meditate in what manner I should apply to you. I was oppressed by fatigue and hunger, and far too unhappy to enjoy the gentle breezes of evening or the prospect of the sun setting behind the stupendous mountains of Jura. At this time, a slight sleep relieved me from the pain of reflection, which was disturbed by the approach of a beautiful child who came running into the recess I had chosen with all the sportiveness of infancy. Suddenly, as I gazed on him, an idea seized me that this little creature was unprejudiced and had lived too short a time to have imbibed a horror of deformity. If, therefore, I could seize him and educate him as my companion and friend, I should not be so desolate in this peopled earth. Urged by this impulse, I seized on the boy as he passed and drew him towards me. As soon as he beheld my form... 
He placed his hand before his eyes and uttered a shrill scream. I drew his hand forcibly from his face and said, Child, what is the meaning of this? I do not intend to hurt you. Listen to me. He struggled violently. Let me go, he cried. Monster! Ugly wretch! You wish to eat me and tear me to pieces. You are an ogre. Let me go, or I will tell my papa. Boy, you will never see your father again. You must come with me. Hideous monster, let me go. My papa is a syndic. He is Monsieur Frankenstein. He will punish you. You dare not keep me. Frankenstein, you belong then to my enemy, to him towards whom I have sworn eternal revenge. You shall be my first victim. The child still struggled and loaded me with epithets which carried despair to my heart. I grasped his throat to silence him, and in a moment he lay dead at my feet. I gazed on my victim, and my heart swelled with exultation and hellish triumph. Clapping my hands, I exclaimed, I too can create desolation. My enemy is not invulnerable. This death will carry despair to him, and a thousand other miseries shall torment and destroy him. For some days I haunted the spot where these scenes had taken place, sometimes wishing to see you, sometimes resolved to quit the world and its miseries forever. At length I wandered towards these mountains, and have ranged through their immense recesses, consumed by a burning passion which you alone can gratify. We may not part until you have promised to comply with my requisition. I am alone and miserable. Man will not associate with me. But one as deformed and horrible as myself would not deny herself to me. My companion must be of the same species and have the same defects. This being you must create. The being finished speaking and fixed his looks upon me in the expectation of a reply. But I was bewildered, perplexed, and unable to arrange my ideas sufficiently to understand the full extent of his proposition. He continued, You must create a female for me, with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. This you alone can do, and I demand it of you as a right which you must not refuse to concede. I do refuse it, I replied, and no torture shall ever extort a consent from me. You may render me the most miserable of men, but you shall never make me base in my own eyes. Shall I create another like yourself, whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? Be gone! I've answered you. You may torture me, but I will never consent. You are in the wrong, replied the fiend, and instead of threatening, I am content to reason with you. I am malicious because I am miserable. Am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? You, my creator, would tear me to pieces and triumph. Remember that, and tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me. You would not call it murder if you could precipitate me into one of those ice rifts and destroy my frame, the work of your own hands. Shall I respect man when he condemns me? Let him live with me in the interchange of kindness, and instead of injury I would bestow every benefit upon him with tears of gratitude at his acceptance. But that cannot be. The human senses are insurmountable barriers to our union. Yet mine shall not be the submission of abject slavery. I will revenge my injuries. If I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear and chiefly towards you, my arch-enemy, because my creator, do I swear inextinguishable hatred. Have a care. I will work at your destruction, nor finish until I desolate your heart, so that you shall curse the hour of your birth. Oh, my creator, make me happy. Let me feel gratitude towards you for one benefit. Let me see that I excite the sympathy of some existing thing. Do not deny me my request. 
I was moved. I shuddered when I thought of the possible consequences of my consent, but I felt that there was some justice in his argument. His tale and the feelings he now expressed proved him to be a creature of fine sensations. And did I not, as his maker, owe him all the portion of happiness that it was in my power to bestow? He saw my change of feeling and continued. I swear, he cried, by the sun and by the blue sky of heaven and by the fire of love that burns my heart that if you grant my prayer, while they exist, you shall never behold me again. Depart to your home and commence your labors. I shall watch their progress with unutterable anxiety and fear not, but that when you are ready, I shall appear. Saying this, he suddenly quitted me, fearful perhaps of any change in my sentiments. I saw him descend the mountain with greater speed than the flight of an eagle and quickly lost among the undulations of the sea of ice. Thus I returned home and, entering the house, presented myself to the family. My haggard and wild appearance awoke intense alarm, but I answered no question, scarcely did I speak. I felt as if I were placed under a ban, as if I had no right to claim their sympathies, as if never more might I enjoy companionship with them. Yet even thus I loved them to adoration, and to save them I resolved to dedicate myself to my most abhorred task. The prospect of such an occupation made every other circumstance of existence pass before me like a dream, and that thought only had to me the reality of life. Day after day, week after week, passed away on my return to Geneva, and I could not collect the courage to recommence my work. I expressed a wish to visit England, but concealing the true reasons of this request. I closed my desires under a guise which excited no suspicion, while I urged my desire with an earnestness that easily induced my father to comply. It was on a clear morning, in the latter days of December, that I first saw the white cliffs of Britain. After some months spent in intellectual pursuit, which merely served to keep me from the object of my journey, I determined to visit some remote spot of Scotland and finish my work in solitude. I did not doubt but that the monster followed me and would discover himself to me when I should have finished, that he might receive his companion. With this resolution, I traversed the northern highlands and fixed on one of the remotest of the Orkneys as the scene of my labours. It was a place fitted for such work, being hardly more than a rock whose high sides were continually beaten upon by the waves. On the whole island... There were but three miserable huts, and one of these was vacant when I arrived. This I hired. It contained but two rooms, and these exhibited all the squalidness of the most miserable penury. I sat one evening in my laboratory. The sun had set, and the moon was just rising from the sea. I had not sufficient light for my employment, and I remained idle. In a pause of consideration of whether I should leave my labor for the night or hasten its conclusion by an unremitting attention to it. I trembled, and my heart failed within me, when, on looking up, I saw, by the light of the moon, the demon at the casement. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me, when I sat fulfilling the task which he had allotted to me. Yes, he had followed me in my travels. He had loitered in the forests, hid himself in caves, or taken refuge in wide and desert heaths, and he now came to mark my progress and claim the fulfillment of my promise. As I looked at him, his countenance expressed the utmost extent of malice and treachery. I thought with a sensation of madness on my promise of creating another like him, and trembling with passion tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. The wretch saw me destroy the creature on whose future existence he depended for happiness, and with a howl of devilish despair and revenge, withdrew. Presently I heard the sound of footsteps along the passage. The door opened, and the wretch, whom I dreaded, appeared. Shutting the door, he approached me and said in a smothered voice, 
You have destroyed the work which you began. What is it that you intend? Do you dare to break your promise? Be gone! I do break my promise. Never will I create another like yourself, equal in deformity and wickedness. Slave, I before reasoned with you, but you have proved yourself unworthy of my condescension. Remember, I have power. You believe yourself miserable, but I can make you so wretched that the light of day will be hateful to you. You are my creator, but I am your master. Obey. The hour of my irresolution is past, and the period of your power is arrived. Your threats cannot move me to do an act of wickedness, but they confirm me in a determination of not creating you a companion in vice. Shall I, in cold blood, set loose upon the earth a demon whose delight is in death and wretchedness? Be gone! I am firm, and your words will only exasperate my rage. The monster saw my determination in my face and gnashed his teeth in the impotence of anger. It is well I go, but remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. His words were forever to ring in my ears. I will be with you on your wedding night. As the night passed, I left the isle, and after tribulations and an illness of which I will not speak, I eventually arrived again at my home in Geneva. Soon after my arrival, my father spoke of my immediate marriage with Elizabeth. I remained silent. Have you then some other attachment? None on earth. I love Elizabeth and look forward to our union with delight. Let the day therefore be fixed, and on it I will consecrate myself in life or death to the happiness of my cousin. As the period fixed for our marriage drew nearer, whether from cowardice or a prophetic feeling, I felt my heart sink within me. But I concealed my feelings by an appearance of hilarity that brought smiles and joy to the countenance of my father, but hardly deceived the ever-watchful and nicer eye of Elizabeth. She looked forward to our union with placid contentment, not unmingled with a little fear which past misfortunes had impressed, that what now appeared certain and tangible happiness might soon dissipate into an airy dream and leave no trace but deep and everlasting regret. After the ceremony was performed, a large party assembled at my father's, but it was agreed that Elizabeth and I should commence our journey by water, sleeping that night at Evian, and continuing our voyage on the following day. The day was fair, the wind favourable, all smiled on our nuptial embarkation. It was eight o'clock when we landed. We walked for a short time on the shore, enjoying the transitory light, and then retired to the inn and contemplated the lovely scene of waters, woods and mountains, obscured in darkness yet still displaying their black outlines. I had been calm during the day, but so soon as night obscured the shapes of objects, a thousand fears arose in my mind. I was anxious and watchful, while my right hand grasped a pistol which was hidden in my bosom. Every sound terrified me, but I resolved that I would sell my life dearly and not shrink from the conflict until my own life and that of my adversary was extinguished. Elizabeth observed my agitation for some time in timid and fearful silence, but there was something in my glance which communicated terror to her, and trembling she asked, What is it that agitates you, my dear Victor? What is it you fear? Oh, peace, peace, my love, replied I. This night and all will be safe. But this night is dreadful, very dreadful. She left me, and I continued some time walking up and down the passages of the house and inspecting every corner that might afford a retreat for my adversary. But I discovered no trace of him and was beginning to conjecture that some fortunate chance had intervened to prevent the execution of his menaces, when suddenly I heard a shrill 
and dreadful scream. It came from the room into which Elizabeth had retired. As I heard it, the whole truth rushed into my mind. My arms dropped. The motion of every muscle and fiber was suspended. I could feel the blood trickling in my veins and tingling in the extremities of my limbs. This state lasted but for an instant. The scream was repeated, and I rushed into the room. Great God! Why did I not then expire? Why am I here to relate the destruction of the best hope and the purest creature on earth? She was there, lifeless and inanimate, thrown across the bed, her head hanging down and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. Could I behold this and live? Alas, life is obstinate and clings closest where it is most hated. For a moment only did I lose recollection. I fell senseless on the ground. Elizabeth was buried and the authorities made but a cursory search for the monster, whom I now, forced by the enormity of my crime, described to them. It was clear that they thought me mad. My first resolution was to quit Geneva forever. My country, which, when I was happy and beloved, was dear to me, now, in my adversity, became hateful. I provided myself with a sum of money, together with a few jewels, which had belonged to my mother, and departed. As night approached, I found myself at the entrance of the cemetery where William and Elizabeth reposed. I entered it and approached the tomb which marked their graves. Everything was silent except the leaves of the trees, which were gently agitated by the wind. The night was nearly dark, and the scene would have been solemn and affecting, even to an uninterested observer. The spirits of the departed seemed to flit around and to cast a shadow, which was felt but not seen around the head of the mourner. The deep grief which this scene had at first excited quickly gave way to rage and despair. They were dead, and I lived. Their murderer also lived, and to destroy him I must drag out my weary existence. I knelt on the grass and kissed the earth on which I kneel. By the shades that wander near me, by the deep and eternal grief that I feel, I swear... And by thee, O knight, and the spirits that preside over thee, to pursue the demon who caused this misery until he or I shall perish in mortal conflict. For this purpose I will preserve my life. To execute this dear revenge will I again behold the sun and tread the green herbage of earth, which otherwise should vanish from my eyes forever. And I call on you, spirits of the dead, and on you, wandering ministers of vengeance, to aid and conduct me in my work. Let the cursed and hellish monster drink deep of agony. Let him feel the despair that now torment me. I was answered through the stillness of night by a loud and fiendish laugh. It rang in my ears long and heavily. The mountains re-echoed it, and I felt as if all hell surrounded me with mockery and laughter. The laughter died away when a well-known and abhorred voice, apparently close to my ear, addressed me in an audible whisper. I am satisfied, miserable wretch. You have determined to live, and I am satisfied. I darted towards the spot from which the sound proceeded, but the devil eluded my grasp. Suddenly the broad disk of the moon arose and shone full upon his ghastly and distorted shape as he fled with more than mortal speed. I pursued him, and for many months this has been my task. Guided by a slight clue, I followed the windings. What his feelings were, whom I pursued, I cannot know. Sometimes, indeed, he left marks in writing on the barks of trees, or cut in stone that guided me and instigated my fury. My reign is not yet over. <laughs> these words were legible in one of these inscriptions. You live and my power is complete. Follow me. 
I seek the everlasting ices of the North, where you will feel the misery of cold and frost to which I am impassive. You will find near this place, if you follow, not too tardily, a dead hare. Eat and be refreshed. Come on, my enemy. We have yet to wrestle for our lives. But many hard and miserable hours must you endure until that period shall arrive. As I still pursued my journey to the northward, the snows thickened and the cold increased to a degree almost too severe to support. The triumph of my enemy increased with the difficulty of my labors. I procured a sledge and dogs, and thus traversed the snows with inconceivable speed. With new courage, therefore, I pressed on, and in two days arrived at a wretched hamlet on the seashore. I inquired of the inhabitants concerning the fiend and gained accurate information. He had escaped me, and I must commence a destructive and almost endless journey across the mountainous ices of the ocean, amidst cold that few of the inhabitants could long endure, and which I, the native of a genial and sunny climate, could not hope to survive. His voice had become fainter as he spoke, and at length, exhausted by his effort, he sank into silence. About half an hour afterwards, he attempted again to speak, but was unable. He pressed my hand feebly, and his eyes closed forever, while the irradiation of a gentle smile passed away from his lips. It was midnight. The breeze blows fairly, and the watch on deck scarcely stir. Again there is a sound as of a human voice, but hoarser. It comes from the cabin where the remains of Frankenstein still lie. I must rise and examine. Great God, what a scene has just taken place. I am yet dizzy with the remembrance of it. I hardly know whether I shall have the power to detail it. Yet the tale which I have recorded would be incomplete without this final and wonderful catastrophe. I entered the cabin, where lay the remains of my ill-fated and admirable friend. Over him hung a form which I cannot find words to describe. Gigantic in stature, yet uncouth and distorted in its proportions. As he hung over the coffin, his face was concealed by long locks of ragged hair. But one vast hand was extended, in color and apparent texture, like that of a mummy. When he heard the sound of my approach, he ceased to utter exclamations of grief and horror and sprang towards the window. Never did I behold a vision so horrible as his face, of such loathsome yet appalling hideousness. I shut my eyes involuntarily and endeavoured to recollect what were my duties with regard to this destroyer. I called on him to stay. He paused, looking on me with wonder, and again turning towards the lifeless form of his creator, he seemed to forget my presence, and every feature and gesture seemed instigated by the wildest rage of some uncontrollable passion. That is also my victim, he exclaimed. In his murder my crimes are consummated. The miserable series of my being is wound to its close. O oh, Frankenstein! Generous and self-devoted being, what does it avail that I now ask thee to pardon me? I, who irretrievably destroyed thee by destroying all thou lovest. Alas, he is cold, he cannot answer me. Farewell, I leave you, and in you the last of mankind whom these eyes will ever behold. Farewell, Frankenstein. If thou wert yet alive and yet cherished a desire of revenge against me, it would be better satiated in my life than in my destruction. But it was not so. Thou didst seek my extinction, that I might not cause greater wretchedness. And if yet in some mode unknown to me thou hadst not ceased to think and feel, thou wouldst not desire against me a vengeance greater than that which I feel. 
Blasted as thou wert, my agony was still superior to thine, for the bitter sting of remorse will not cease to rankle in my wounds until death shall close them for ever. But soon, he cried with sad and solemn enthusiasm, I shall die, and what I now feel be no longer felt. Soon these burning miseries will be extinct. I shall ascend my funeral pile triumphantly and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. The light of that conflagration will fade away. My ashes will be swept into the sea by the winds. My spirit will sleep in peace. Or, if it thinks, it will not surely think thus. Farewell. Farewell.